You kill people with that, do you? Killed everyone I ever met out here. Headshots, all of them snap right in the medulla. Thought somehow you girls were above all that. Welcome to the Mad Max Minute. Plant yourself in a chair and remain seated. This is Mad Max Fury Road, one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 84, which begins with the dag asking about the Keeper of Seeds' rifle, and it ends with the Keeper of the Seeds talking about how things used to be. Julia, I just want to thank you at the top of today's episode for not audibly groaning at those puns. I heard a joke at work today. I tried to grab onto the fog, but I missed. <laughs> and when I heard that joke, I laughed. I laughed out loud. It's it's a dumb little pun, but it's funny. Mm -hmm. We kick off today's minute with the dag changing the subject from talking about how her baby could be a boy, could be a girl. I don't know. They haven't opened the colored cake or popped the balloon full of dust yet. You know, it's this whole thing that weird people full do of nowadays. Dust? You know, colored dust. You pop the balloon, it's got blue or pink dust, and there you go. Glitter, sprinkles. Yeah, whatever. I don't know. Confetti, dust. <sighs> Parents these days. Anyway, the dag changes the subject. She looks back at the Keeper of the Seeds and she says, Ah, oh, you kill people with that, do you? So the Keeper of the Seeds in this scene is cleaning her rifle, and it appears to be, according to the internet movie Firearms Database, a Jezeel musket. So a Jezeel or Jezail, whatever, however it's pronounced. It's a type of long-barrel, muzzle-loading musket made in the Middle East, Asia, and India up until the early 20th century. Since Jezails were made to order by individual craftsmen, they are not standardized, having either matchlock or flintlock mechanisms, and often used brown best flintlock musket lockwork, and sometimes had rifle barrels, but are typically identified by their unusual horn-shaped stock. They were similar to American Frontier-era hunting rifles, but were typically heavier and larger with calibers in the 50 and 75 range, and they were used in a similar role to modern sniper rifles. Their heavy weight and long barrel led to a much greater effective range than standard infantry muskets, and they were used to fearsome effect by Afghan snipers during the Anglo-Afghan Wars in the 19th century. So what you're saying is this is an old gun. Yes. Very much like how Joe and his war parties favor older cars with more sturdy materials, the Vuvulini prefer older weapons that are just more sturdy and basic. A lot of the rifles that the Vuvulini use are muzzle-loading style. That way they're not beholden to manufactured ammunition, which is something I said the other week. Mm -hmm. I'm repeating myself at this point. I like the idea of this deliberate independence, even though it costs them in time and energy. It's worth it to them to not have to trade with the bullet farm. Mm -hmm. So this seems like as good a time as any to get to know the Keeper of the Seeds. She is played by Melissa Jaffer. Her top four on IMDb include this movie, Fury Road, 1976's Caddy, 2004's Farscape The Peacekeeper Wars, which is the feature-length movie special that they made for the Farscape TV show. She was also in 1975's Ride a Wild Pony. Isn't Farscape the one where that uh, What's-Her-Face the Warrior Woman was in? Yes, it is. Alrighty. So, Melissa Jaffer was born December 1st, 1936 in Gladstone, South Australia. Now, from the Laredo College Ballarat website... They describe her early life. When World War II began, her father joined the RAAF, and her mother supported the family as a secretary to the head of the munitions factory. Her mother sang for Amelita Galli Gerci of the Metropolitan Opera House and was predicted to have a brilliant future, but did not pursue this career. Because when her father returned from the war, they bought the Royal George Hotel in Kyneton, Victoria. Melissa and her sister Juanita attended Laredo's Marymount. Melissa from 1948 until 1950. Melissa's first exposure to film was Laurence Olivier's Hamlet, shown on a donated projector at the school. After leaving school, Melissa met William Carr, 
head of the National Theatre School and Company in Melbourne, who gave her the part of Helena in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The Jaffer's first credit on IMDb is You Too Can Have a Body, which is a TV movie in 1960. She continued working on television over the next several years, appearing on Division 4 and Homicide, which everybody will recognize, before appearing in her first listed feature film, The Cars That Ate Paris, in 1974. You may remember me bringing up that movie when we were talking about the design of the buzzards and how spiky those cars were. She was in that movie. So in 1976, Melissa Jaffer was awarded an AFI Award for Best Actress in a Supporting Role for the movie Caddy. She continued working in film and on television consistently, including her role on Farscape in 2000. That's the science fiction show that also had Virginia Hay in it. Following Mad Max Fury Road, she has continued acting in television and has a short in post-production. Now, quick question. Do we want to go through the hassle of calling the Keeper of the Seeds by that full title, or do we just want to call her Melissa? Ooh, that's a tough call. At first, I was about to say Melissa because it's simpler, but she is a named character. And we've complained a lot over the last four movies that George Miller often doesn't give, especially his female characters' names, just labels. So he gave her, well, now it's Keeper of the Seeds is still a label, not a name. Okay, Melissa it is. At least with Megan Gale's character, the Valkyrie, that's quick. And it's pretty awesome sounding. Yes, it is. But the Keeper of the Seeds is just a mouthful. Grammatically, it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. So let's go with Melissa. More names for people to remember. Yes. Melissa, in response to the Dag's comment about, oh, you kill people with that thing, do you? She says that she's killed everyone she's ever met out here. Headshots, all of them, snap right in the medulla. So the medulla, it's an anatomical noun. It is the inner region of an organ or tissue, especially when it is distinguishable from the outer region or cortex, as in a kidney or adrenal gland or hair. Now, where it's used as a short for medulla oblongata, the medulla oblongata is the continuation of the spinal cord within the skull, forming the lowest part of the brainstem and containing control centers for the heart and lungs. Which is what she's referring to. Exactly. It's a quick death. So I looked up on the Livestrong website. If the medulla oblongata or the nerves that pass through it are injured or damaged, you may experience paralysis or loss of muscle coordination. You may lose your sense of touch, develop vertigo, or have trouble swallowing. You may not be able to sense or detect pain and temperature changes. In this area, the nerves cross sides, so if the right side of the medulla oblongata is injured, then the symptoms will appear on the left side of the body and vice versa. Long story short, if you're getting shot with a muzzle-loading rifle that is firing 50 to 75 caliber shots, you're not going to have a medulla left. It's going to get obliterated, and you're just done. And what I like about this is that it highlights the ruthless efficiency of the Vuvolini. Well, they have to be. Their rifles are manuals. One shot per couple minutes. I don't know. How long does it take to reload a muzzle gun? I feel like minutes is a good estimation. Yeah. Under less than ideal circumstances, I think you could be very well within rights to expect at least a two to three minute reload time. Yeah. Maybe a one to two minute if I want to talk about people rushing. Yeah, and there's also definitely a skill level there that we certainly do not have. I mean, if this is how you defend yourself, then you have a certain skill level. Going back to when massive national armies used muzzle-loading rifles, they would have them line up in big lines, and one line would shoot a volley, and they would fall back. Another line would step forward, they'd shoot a volley, and then they'd step back, and they would cycle around all of these rows of riflemen so that they would have time to reload. Sounds awful. Yeah, the mid to late 1700s was not a great time for military strategy. It was a lot of, let's all just stand in a bunch of lines and whoever loses the least amount of guys at the end of the day just wins. Then they came to America and we started hiding in trees like, you know, smart people (laughs) using a little thing called cover. But that's history. (laughs) Hearing Melissa describe shooting people in the medulla, the dag, she responds with, huh, thought somehow you girls were above all that. And 
I have to wonder if that's coming from Furiosa talking up the many mothers as the intellectual opposites of Immortan Joe, where Immortan Joe represents violence and coercion. Furiosa would sell the many mothers as nurturing and cultivating as opposed to destroying. It's hard to tell if that was an accurate description of them at the time. She left when she was a child. We estimated like 10 preteen age range. That may have just been the side that she saw. They may have always been ruthless and exacting like they are now. Or they are a product of their environment. Once upon a time, they had the luxury to be intellectual and compassionate And that time is gone. When it comes to living in the wasteland, ruthlessness is just the order of the day. If you are not picking people off from a distance by shooting them in the medulla, then they're going to try to take your stuff. Yeah, it's either you or them. And if you want to survive, you do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And it's ugly. And it's surprising to people expecting the stereotypical female that is gentle and a provider. That's not what these women are. But it is also an aspect of who they are. Like, Melissa looks a bit worried that the dag would harbor that sentiment. And so she calls her over to the motorcycle and she pulls out a bag so that she can show off this thing that she has. And to act as a counterpoint to the brown bag full of guns and bullets that we saw earlier, the anti-seed, as Ang Herod used to call them, here we have a brown bag full of actual seeds, things that represent the cultivation of life, showing the dag that, sure, the Vuvulini kill strangers, but they're not obsessed with pillaging and destroying, they're also interested in growing and cultivating and creating. Yeah, she remembers a time when... There was plenty when they didn't have to kill. And she is actively working towards getting back to that, Mm -hmm. where they don't need their guns anymore, that anybody who comes along can have plenty. It's a real shame that a society that used to have plenty and used to be green and vibrant was driven to this point where they set traps and they kill anyone they see but there's hope which is driven home by this little plant growing in an animal skull but it's growing reminds me of Mm wally where the planet is dead and dying so much so that humans evacuated but they want to come home well their computer program is set up to want to come home yeah and you have evie who is searching for any sign that the earth is repairing itself, that it's not sour anymore. And she finds one. She finds this little sapling. It's like the exact same thing. And Evie scoops it up and carries it around with her because it's precious. And just like here with the keeper of the seeds, it's great that you have this one sapling, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how everywhere they go, She takes an opportunity when she can to plant one of these seeds just to see if it'll take root. And the dag is very interested in this. She's intrigued by it. You know, she's like, where? And Melissa's like, well, nowhere has been clean enough yet. We talked a bit on Wednesday about, oh, how much do they move around? They're probably trying to find somewhere that is no longer sour, that's no longer poisoned by whatever is plaguing the wasteland, probably radiation, because that's usually what we call it. But they're trying to get somewhere, somewhere that these seeds will take root and begin to grow again so that they can bounce back from this. And she has a amazing assortment in this bag. She describes them as trees, flowers, fruit, everything that you would need to have biodiversity. It's just so sad. I mean, it is hopeful, which is really, it's the part of the story that we're in right now. We had sad. We did sad this week. We're supposed to be climbing our way out of sad Mm -hmm. with this bag. But being aware of how important the single bag is, is very disheartening. Like, to the real world, that it could all come down to what individuals are able to do to keep those seeds in the bag. 
When this movie was made in 2015, the seed vault in the Netherlands existed. It was started in 2008. But if we're going on the timeline of this movie takes place in 2015, when the apocalypse happened, there was no seed vault. Oh, really? So there's no backup. Literally, all there is is individual stashes. And how many people in the world have been thoughtful enough to gather those stashes? Yikes, I don't know. So this is it. It is down to individuals to rescue the planet. It's adding stakes to the story. Absolutely. We have changed the story a bit where we've added this element. Okay, not only do the Vuvulini represent what's left of the green place, they also represent the best hope for allowing these seeds to once again germinate somewhere, adding a lot of importance to their presence. It is very hopeful, but it's hard to see the hope. But it's there. It's just a long shot. Yeah. And I think the Dag sees that hope, too. She's impressed. There's so many different kinds, and she's genuinely interested. Especially coming from somebody who isn't unfamiliar with green things. She knows exactly what they are as soon as she sees them. Because she's familiar with green things. She's familiar with fresh food and clean water, and plants, and trees. Speaking of green things, I'm looking at second 36, where the keeper of the seeds is holding that tiny animal skull with the plant inside. Everything in this frame is blue, except for the leaves on that plant. They are green. That's definitely not natural. Oh no, it's definitely a side effect of them shooting this day for night. And I think that green must be brightened up. Oh, absolutely. Made more green to get through this blue filter that they've got going on. Yeah. Yuri and Travis talked about this whole day for night shot thing. And obviously when you shoot in the daylight, the camera is able to absorb so much more information. Then digitally, you can come in and blue shift everything. And the nice thing about digitally blue shifting everything is that you can isolate certain areas of the frame to not be blue shifted like they can darken it up a little bit because it is supposed to be night but they can keep that vibrant green on that plant to really hammer home that hey this is the only green thing that we're going to get out of the green place right now so pay attention to it (laughs) but getting back to the dialogue when melissa brings up the fact that everybody used to have their fill and that back then there was no need to snap anybody we cut to a two shot and the dag smiles She looks down at the seeds and the corners of her mouth pull up. She doesn't full teeth smile, but there's a bit of a grin there because she's got that element of hope. I like that the dag can be charmed. This isn't the first time that she has smiled in this kind of way. Back when she was being inspected, I think, by Melissa. This one's got all her teeth. After her hands are out of the dag's mouth, the dag kind of turns and kind of giggles a little like smiles and acts a little bit like maybe a little shy, but not really. It's a little move that's kind of sweet. I like that the dag and the keeper of the seeds are making this connection. I also took note of the dag's hair. Mm -hmm. It has been braided. I feel like the dag's hair throughout the movie has been a big part of her persona, that it's been very long and kind of in her face and accentuated by this almost headdress that she's been wearing, which is gone now. And her hair has been braided in a couple of braids, and there's woven into it like an ornament. And I think this is just a girly thing. I think there is a group of girls getting together, and one of them played with her hair, Hmm. which is a thing that happens. I think having her hair braided is just more practical in this situation. More manageable. It really is. I didn't fancy her hair just down. (laughs) She doesn't have thick hair. She has relatively thin hair, as you can tell by the size of the braid. So it just kind of seemed, I don't know, a little mangy, Mm -hmm. a little stringy. (laughs) I think she looks very nice with her hair back out of her face. Yeah. Yeah. In the last several seconds of this minute, we cut away from Melissa and the dag over to Max, and he's got this little scrap of fabric, and he's holding a small compass from the look of it, and he's dipping a needle into a open wound on his hand and he is inking what we are going to find out later is a map. He's chronicling where they've come 
where they're going, trying to get a lay of the land. It makes a lot more sense to me now. Something that he did way far back when they were entering the canyon. And he was like, no, we're not going in there. He knew exactly where they were and where they were going because he keeps a map. He keeps records of places that he's been, what he's learned about the landscape. Because frankly, it all looks the same out there. Yeah, I imagine that if you don't keep track of where you're going every once in a while, that you will just end up going in circles. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw this shot, I thought he was actually doing the opposite. I thought he was tattooing himself Mm. until I realized that he didn't have like a well of ink or anything. Yeah. What's interesting is that I don't think we've seen this little compass before. This is a trinket that he hasn't used yet in this movie. No, I agree. I don't think we've seen it. Granted, when would he have the opportunity to use this compass? But still, it does seem like a pretty useful thing to have. Oh, for sure. Joe has one in the Giga Horse. I'm surprised they didn't have one up on the dash in the war rig. I wonder if that's because the rig is meant to do one thing. Mm. Drive on that road straight to Gastown. As the driver, she doesn't need a compass. She's not making her own decisions about where she drives. She's driving on a prescribed path, and that's it. Kind of see compasses in Joe's cult as something you have to earn, something that very few people have, if anybody else has one at all. Maybe Joe's the only one that even has one. Mm -hmm. That they're just not common. Perhaps. It could just be that they're a rare item. They're hard to come by. Yeah. Which is why Max keeps his hidden. Does it happen in this minute where Furiosa is walking up behind him and he... It is at the very tail end of this minute where we see Furiosa walking up and I think Max is starting to put his map away. Yeah. As soon as he gets the sense that there's somebody behind him, he puts his things away. Because this is his map. Yeah. It's not something that he shares. But we'll have to wait until later to figure out why Furiosa is coming over to talk to Max, because we have reached the end of the minute. We're going to have to put a pin in all of this. So come back on Monday. We'll see Max hiding his map before Furiosa can see it. And Furiosa will tell Max all about her plan that she's worked out with the Vuvulini and that he's got a place in it as long as he wants it. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com, where you can see what's in our Tee Public store, join our Patreon, or even donate to the show to help us keep the tanks full. Thank you for joining us for Minute 84 of Fury Road. We'll see you next time.